I'm in Romans chapter 5 today, and if you're a guest, I almost always put every one of the verses that I use are going to be on your notes. Sometimes I add some later, and I'll tell you that, but I think all the verses that I'm using today are on your notes. But, but one of the things that, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been counseling people for years. I mean, that's what I did for a living before I became a pastor, and uh, I, I just... I worked daily with people who were just always trying to fill this God-sized void that they had in their life. They, they, they tried to fill it with success and achievement. They tried to fill it with perfection in, in all, in either part or in all areas of their life. They, they, would, they would have one relationship after another because they're looking for that thing that, to, that, that, that needs to be, that's going to be there for the rest of their life. They, they try all these different things. People that need people approval, I, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm still a, a people approval person, but that used to just eat my lunch, you know. If, if, a, if, if somebody didn't smile at me right behind the counter, I would make another trip around and figure out how to make them smile. I mean, you know, it just kind of dominated my life. And, and, and all of those things, all of those things, the problem with trying to fill a God-sized void with something other than God, right, is it don't work. Now, it works sometimes, it, or it feels like it works sometimes. So it's kind of like gambling. Do you know that gambling is, a, is harder uh, addiction to break than even drug addiction. You know why? Because gambling only you only you only receive a reward every once in a while in gambling. So so if you quit gambling and uh, if you can lose and lose and lose in gambling and you won't quit because you know you know when you're trying to break a habit or a problem somebody else has you you stop d- doing it for a while and they get to the point where it's not a habit. Well well, well gambling's not that way. Well well so. I think it's like that a lot when we gamble with our faith and when we depend on God sometimes and not on other times is, is, is we, when we do the stuff that makes us feel good, perfectionism, achievement, whatever, and it works, we'll keep trying that over and over and over again to fill that void. And then when it doesn't work, we get into trouble because we overspend. We, we get into trouble because we do other things to try to take the edge off, like self-medicating or, or, or sexual relationships or, or, or a, a lot of different things that cause problems in our life. I heard a pastor say this this week. Listen to see this sounds kind of cool. Being Peter Pan is fun, but you can't live in Neverland forever. I'm calling today's message, You Haven't Lived until you live because lots and lots of times in my past as I've tried to tell people about having a relationship with Christ they will say to me something like we talked about this a few years ago a few weeks ago I want to keep living I, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna trust in God one of these days but but right now I want to live my life and I want to have fun and I want to whatever and 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 here's here's something that you have to know and if you don't know it it's because you haven't been there yet if you can get to the point in your life where you're devoted to God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit is living in your life and what's going to end up happening is and instead of turning over a new leaf, you will become a changed person and you will live life like you've never lived life before. I mean, to feel guilt-free, to feel God's love, to be under God's grace, to, to, to know that you've got a purpose in life because you're living out your life as God's love with skin. All of those things are, are, are important to, to change lives. You, you feel more valued. You feel more loved. Your, your life is completely changed. I started off with a, a paragraph on your, on your notes. Look at the first paragraph on your notes is this. Following Christ is simple, but it won't be easy. We've talked about that, right? We've, we've talked about that. You know that. Following Christ is simple. I mean, God lays it out, the commitment to Christ. There's a lot of things in the Bible that just we don't understand very well, but when it comes to, to following Christ and understanding God's will, he's made that pretty simple, but, but it's not easy. It's difficult. It, it's, it's hard. It, it's going to be, uh, you know, I have people all the time say, well, you know, I committed my life to Christ, and I started living for him, and all of a sudden my life just got bad. Well, let me tell you something. I promise you that's going to happen in one way or the other. If you're going through a season right now where everything's good, well, there's going to come a bad season, but, but that's important. We're going to be talking about that here in just a minute. It will be, if you live the life that we're talking about, committed to Christ, it will be a life of peace with God, not peace all the time in life circumstances, but, but peace with God, hope, joy, self-improvement, 
a strong sense of the presence of God in your life and, and his love and continual forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Now, the problem is we often struggle with both sides. There's, there's two sides of our faith that we have to struggle with. There's, there's the, the blessings that we know we have. We can read the Word of God and we understand that if we accept Christ and we live for Him, we have these certain blessings. But we also know that there's, there's this other side we have to deal with. We're, we're blessed in knowing that we've been justified. We've talked about that the last few weeks. We've been saved. We've been uh, forgiven for our sins. We're guilt-free. We can go on. We can live our life that way with, that, with a new connection with God. But we've also got to deal with being sanctified. Y'all remember what that word is? Sanctification is the daily process, you know. Justification is an act. It happens. You, you become a Christian. You get your fire insurance. You, all of that other good stuff happens right away. But then you've got a sanctification where you're constantly working with the good things and the bad things in your life to become more like Jesus. So the ultimate goal is that when you die, when you go to heaven, instant sanctification but in the meantime you've got this process that you've got to live through and and what happens is 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 people get all excited about the blessings and the justification but they struggle like crazy with the sanctification but you know i mean seriously is there any other thing that you do in life that you don't get better unless you go through a little bit of pain to get better at the job, to get better as a musician, to get better at anything, you've got to sacrifice and discipline and, and, and do those kind of things. To, to really live, to really live the kind of life that, that God wants you to live, you will be a different person. You will be changed. And let me, I'm going to give you just a few things from Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. This is so, every week when I get ready, prepare to teach you guys I think man there's just too much I was going to do like all of chapter 5 today and, and that's just impossible and y'all could say thank you to me afterwards but 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 here I'm going to give you seven things that you get with living the blessed life seven things that you get when you've when after you've been justified and you're living your life toward sanct during the process of sanctification the first one is this number one peace with God always peace with God always this is important. This isn't, um, this isn't peace. This isn't just peace like a lack of conflict. Because, you know, we even read the heroes of the Bible, and there were places where, you know, people that were even prophets of God were arguing with them sometimes, you know. So, so that, that doesn't mean a, an absence of conflict. But, but, but peace is a different. Well, look at, look at verse 1. Therefore, now, I heard a pastor say one time, I know this is cheesy, but it works. Anytime there's a therefore, you've got to look and see what it's there for, right? You've heard that before? So we've, we've just got through, Paul has just gotten through telling us uh, how sorry we are, and then he told us how righteous we are through God, and then he told us through Abraham and David how we uh, uh, have our righteousness through our faith, and he's done all that, and now he says, therefore... Since we have been made right in God's sight by what? Faith. Have y'all gotten the part yet? It's not about works. You know, the works are going to come because of your faith and because of your love. But your works isn't the way you earn your being made right with God. So, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. The, world, the, the, word tell, the Word of God tells us, remember, remember the definition of evil? What's the definition of evil? Somebody said it last week sitting right there. The definition of evil, remember what it is? It's doing things not what God wants you to do, staying separated from God. Matter of fact, the Bible, tell, the Bible calls people who aren't reconciled with God evil. Now, I know that sounds bad and it's not very politically correct nowadays. But evil or wicked, when you see that in Scripture, it usually doesn't mean a bad guy that's robbing places and killing people. It, it, it means it's people that's separated from God. So the Bible says that as long as we're evil, let's just use that word because it's a cool word. As long as, we, as long as we are evil, separated from God, there is no peace. And, and some of you know that even as believers, when we're living our lives separated from God, that's when we struggle with anxiety the most and depression the most and relationship problems the most and, and all those kind of things because there's no peace in your life. When, there's, when, there's, when you have that peace in your life that comes from God, what, what happens is, is it carries out into other things. 
the way you handle your job, the way you relate to your spouse, the way you deal with people when they're jacking with you, all of those things, you, you have this peace that comes. Well, the Bible calls it the peace that passes all understanding. It's weird when you get this peace because, you know, as a, as a counselor, I would often counsel people who were married who had something terrible going on in their life. They were having an affair or looking at pornography or had other problems that they were trying to keep from their spouse all the time. And, and something amazing would happen when, when, when a person would get found out. This relief would come. Now, it wouldn't fix their marriage right away, right? But, but there's, there's, a relief that, there's a relief that there's not this sin going on in your life that nobody knows about. You know what I'm saying? And that's the kind of thing that happens when, when you ask for forgiveness and when you repent and you give your life up to Christ. Then, then what happens is, is Jesus frees up your past. Your past is freed up. Now, we've talked about there's, there's still consequences and things you're going to have to deal with. And just like, it's funny because, well, maybe funny is not the word, but ironic that I'll be dealing with a man who's been got some major problem and he's just told his wife and his wife's freaking out and doesn't trust him and all this other kind of stuff but he's just got this just feels so good to honey i'm going to work on it i'm going to get better i'm going to it just feels so good that's how it is when we accept the love and the grace of christ we're we're freed up from our past it it brings a lot of weight off of our shoulders we've been released from our past the 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 hebrew word for that is we've used this is is shalom and and shalom means peace again not in, not like peace and not having conflict but but peace and wholeness that void is filled that and i like this word peace and holiness a sense of purpose a sense of understanding how much god loves you and that it's our job to 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 do his job Psalm 85.10 in this world. Psalm 85.10, the psalmist writes, The unfailing love and truth met together, and righteousness and peace have kissed. That righteousness is what gives you that peace. And then, so, so that's really the blessing that comes with, with our, our, our past. There, there's also a blessing that comes with the present, with what everything that's going on in life for you right now. Look at number two. Number two is, in verse 2a, personal access to God. Personal access to God. I mean, like always. You know, it's, it's important that you do church. It's important that you do worship. There are things that, there are things that you can't do. There are, you cannot obey God if you're not doing the things that you do as part of a church family. Right? Do you understand that? But... We have access to God all the time. And, and you could just imagine, remember Paul is writing this letter to these brand new Christians and a whole lot of them used to be are Jewish Christians, right? They've just gone from living the Jewish faith to living the, to the, living the Christian faith. So all of a sudden, they've gone from, I can't have a personal relationship with God. I have a priest that takes care of that for me. And now they've gone to, I have this personal relationship with God, and not only can I talk to Him, but He has made Himself His spirit home in me. This is a huge life change for these people. That, that they're looking at. We've got this, this, we've been, the, one of the commentators I was reading said that the, the word here for, uh, for access to God, the undeserved privilege of where we stand, it, that, that word means being ushered in by somebody else. In other words, somebody, Jesus came and he brought us and he, introduce us to God and now we've got a special privilege we've got a special privilege as being a the same privileges that a that a child would have to the king we've got direct access to the king our past so our our past is wiped clean and now we can talk to God and have this personal relationship with God that's never been available before and then number three talks about our future Number three is we have a joyful hope in our glorious future. We have a joyful hope in our glorious 
future. Look at, um, look at 2B. Now remember, is pride a good thing or not a good thing? Pride's a bad thing. As a matter of fact, the, the Bible says that pride makes us an enemy of God. When we're prideful in our own self and our own abilities and the own things that, that we can do, then what we're doing is we're literally drawing a line and we're saying we're better. We're, we're making ourselves enemies of God. But there's a difference in pride and confidence. The confidence that comes in our relationship with God. Now, I know, I, I know a lot of Christians that don't have a whole lot of confidence in their faith. I mean, they've got so little confidence in their faith. You can ask somebody at their job if, if he's a Christian or not. And they'll say, I don't have a clue. He never talks about it. He never does it. I mean, does he go, you know, I don't know. He's a pretty good guy. But, but, but it's a confidence. It, it's a confidence we have. And, and, and look, there's, there's no way in the world that you'll have confidence in your faith if you're not living it out. Faith in itself, the word faith means that, you're, that you trust God and you're living the way that God wants you to live your life. But the joyful hope for the glorious future, look at verse 2b. Uh, and we confidently, say that with me, confidently, you should be confident in your faith. And if you're not, it's not, your, it's not God's fault. It's, it's your fault. He's given you everything to be confident about. Confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Now, now the, the cool thing about this is that, you know, a lot of people when they become Christians, especially if they just become Christians, they make a commitment to Christ and then they just kind of back off. They have some kind of spiritual experience in a church service or, or they walk the aisle. Or, and, and, I, and I think the whole walking the aisle thing, and I've read a lot of things on this lately from a lot of pastors that have been around a long time. The, the, whole, the whole walking up the aisle thing and making a commitment has given a lot of people a false sense of confidence. Because what they, they, they grab hold of the justification, the, 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 the act of, of that happening through God, and, and all of a sudden they think that that should count for everything. And it doesn't. If, if you want to have this kind of confidence and, and share in God's glory, then you've got to live it out. And here's the neat thing. You get to live it out here. Did you know that? You don't have to wait till you go to heaven. Just what I was talking about a little while ago, looking for the little things instead of looking for the miraculous things all the time. It's just amazing when, when you start. I don't know if I've told you this story or not. I was telling it to the kids the other night. So if I told you to you before, I'm sorry. But I told you all that I, I, I've gotten to where when I'm having a bad day, I, I pray about it. I, not just pray, oh, God, save me. It's I pray for encouragement. God, would you encourage me some way? You know, if you want to, save me from this problem completely right now then i'm okay with that but but would you just give me a would you throw me a bone you know so i had these conversations with god so so one day i'm i'm driving to work and it was a it was a day that just didn't go well it was just a things just weren't going right and i was worried about this or worried about this i, I was struggling and 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 i'm i'm driving up glade and i'm about the time i'm passing chick-fil-a i said god would you just encourage me, please? Just would you would you give me something to let me know that I'm not out here by myself? And isn't it funny how God blesses us, and then a little while later we kind of forget that He's there. So all of a sudden I thought I'm hungry, so I pulled into Chick Fil A, and I don't know if you know this Chick Fil A over here, but this Chick Fil A over here is cars like lined up around it all the time. You know what I'm talking about? Always. So I I pull into the Chick Fil A, and and cars are just lined up around it, and I never like to go through the drive through anyway. It drives Lisa nuts. So I go inside, and, and I walk in, and there's, there's nobody at the counter. There's 85 bazillion people lined up around, and there's nobody at the counter at Chick-fil-A. So I walk up, and believe me, and I, I know I'm, I always try to be a good representative of Christ, and I walk in, and I'm just, it ain't up. You know, I'm just, I'm just so I walk in, and I said, hi, I'll, can I just get a sandwich to go? And no, I don't need a drink. And, and, I'm, and so the lady smiles at me and rings it up, and, hands it to me and said look I'm sorry you had to wait she goes you can have that for free <laughs> huh you wish that would happen to you but that was that was do you think that was encouragement 
Do you think that was a God thing? I'm driving by Chick-fil-A and I said, God, would you just give me some encouragement? And, and I, you may not think that. You may think that's coincidence. You may think whatever. Look, if you start looking for God things to happen in your life, they're going to happen. And the people out there that don't get those things, they're going to be bah humbugging you. And you're going to be, yeah, you know what I'm saying? But, it, but God does that. Start doing that. And, and, you know, it's funny because I told the lady, I, well, I, I was about to argue with her because, but I said, thank you. And I left. And, and I was in a better mood after that. Number four, you will develop the character of Christ. Y'all, there's that sanctification thing. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be developing the character. You know, Romans 8, 28 said that God takes all things and makes them work for the good. You know what verse 29 says? So that you will be like Jesus. That's a paraphrase, but that's what verse 29 says. Look what verse 3 and 4 says. And y'all have probably heard this, this couple of verses before. We can rejoice, right? You see how it starts? We can rejoice. That's a yay. You get that? We can rejoice in when we run into problems and trials. You usually don't have rejoice right before that sentence. But with God you do. For we know that they help us develop what? Endurance. And endurance develops what? Strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. There's those two words again. Confident and hope. God uses the pain that we have. See, for, for somebody that doesn't know the Lord, pain's just a pain. It's something that I've got to get through. When pain comes to a Christian, we can go, you know, I really don't like this a whole lot, but the joy I have is when I get on the other side of this, I'm going to be better, I'm going to be stronger, I'm going to be more like Jesus. I'm going to have more faith. That's the confident hope. I'm going to have more faith. You know why I know? I know because I've done it. It's hard to have confident faith in something you haven't done. You know? It'd be like training to play football all the time and never, ever, ever get out there on the field and try it out like the Cowboys. But <laughs> pain, endurance, character, hope, suffering is a big deal to these people in Rome at this point. They are being tortured. They're being killed. They're being called names. They're being treated terribly. All because they're this new way, the, the Christian movement that's happening at this time. But you can't build endurance without the pain. And you won't develop your character. One of the best ways to test your character is to see how you react under pressure. And we talked about this, I think, last week. It's easy to act like a Christian here, right? Is it easy to act like a Christian on the job side? It's probably not. And if you don't act like a Christian on the job side, I'm just telling you, no character. You're lacking character. You're not the person that you say you are, and, and you're being a terrible witness. But, but when you're under that pressure, when you're under that stress, you, you build your character, and your character is the thing that helps you with with your hope. You've got to look when you're, when you're under pressure. Look, when Lisa and I started tithing, we had no income coming in. I have people tell me all the time, hey, well, we're, we're trying to get on board with God and, and we're going to start giving and, and we, when our finances get okay. I want to tell you something. There's nothing biblical about that. And, and you're not building your character if you're not making that kind of, of, a, of, of an effort. Uh, if uh, it, it, it's easy to love somebody if they're loving you back. Would you agree? I mean, oh, is, that a lot? is it hard to love somebody who's not loving you back? Are you supposed to love someone who's not loving you back? Yeah, that's how you're going to grow your character. That's how you're going to grow your character. It's, it's easy to commit your time to God when you have time. But what do you cut out when you don't have time? You know what most people cut out? God. They cut out God. I, I've told y'all how important it is for you to be at church on Sunday. It's not just for you. I mean, you always go, hey, yeah, I'm glad, glad I came. And, I'm, you know, even though it was, it was hard to get up and it was, it was hard to get here. But, but it's, it's for that guest that came and you were the one they sat next to or you were the one that smiled at them when they walked in the front door. And they were, 
You know, there, there's a whole lot of reasons for you to be at church besides it's your shift to work in the kid connection. But what happens is, is when, when, when our time gets challenged, we give up things. We'd rather go to... When, when Nicholas was uh, playing baseball, we got him on this baseball team that all of a sudden they started telling us they were playing Sunday mornings. Guess what? Nick didn't play on Sunday morning. He was their starting catcher. You know what the team did? They shifted some of their games. When you're under pressure, are you going to be the kind of Christian that you're supposed to be? That's how your character. You know, when we talk about the pain there, we, we talk about, we think about illness or losing our job and things like that. But, but pain comes when you're a Christian when it's not popular or doesn't feel good to be a Christian. Number five, we are filled with, we are filled with, it doesn't sound right. Okay, this is all about love. Okay, we are filled with, or we have wholeness in God's love. Okay, that doesn't sound exactly right, but that's what I meant. We are filled with, or we have God's wholeness in, in, in God's love. There's, there's a sense, every human being is looking for love. That's why, we, that's why some of us are so messed up, because we didn't get love from our parents. That's why some of us are so messed up from bad relationships that we had. We want love. That's something that's been put into us. And the reason we have that void is because when we got separated from God, that love wasn't there naturally anymore. Well, guess what? Jesus fixed that. Look at verse 5. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God, what? loves us because he has given us the holy spirit to fill our hearts with his love y'all it's there all the time even when you're not feeling loved it's there that's the cool thing about the holy spirit being in your life that's the kind of thing that a person can't give you but the holy spirit fills you with that love verse six when we were utterly helpless christ came at just the right time and he died for us sinners now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed His great love for us who were evil by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Circle that. While we were still sinners. There's, there's nothing you do, you did to make Jesus Christ die for you. He died for you because you were a sinner and He wanted you reconnected to him and the Father. Number six, we have guaranteed protection from God's future condemnation. Some of your translations say wrath. The wrath of God. We are, we are freed from the future wrath. We're freed from, from any kind of judgment that comes from God that would send us away from God. We're, we're freed from that. That gives us a confident hope. And again, this is one of those things. It's futuristic. It's really hard to think about future things. The only way you can really feel good about that is if you're living your life like you're supposed to in faith. Since we have been made right in God, since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God has restored by the death of His Son, while we were still His enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. And then number seven, and then we're going to have communion. Number seven is we'll have great joy. In our relationship with God now and for eternity. I don't know. You know, there are different people that come to churches for different reasons. And this isn't just in our church, this is in a lot of churches on Sunday morning. If 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 you're a person that's in the teaching, then you'll get to church and sit out in the lobby for two or three songs and then come in. We do everything we do on Sunday morning for a reason. I was running around this morning. We had some guest worship leaders. We hadn't had wor guest worship leaders in a while, so I was trying to figure out, do we have our bases covered? Did we, did we do this? Did we, Cameron usually does our PowerPoint, so we had to figure that out. All, all this stuff was, was happening this morning, and, and man, I, I just want to tell you all something. I was getting ready to get up and teach all the Word of God, and I was stressed. I'm stressed usually anyway, but I was really stressed. And a couple of those songs we were singing, 
I couldn't sing them because I was getting so choked up. You know, see, God uses music. It, it helps prepare our heart. You remember there's a, there's a place in the Old Testament where, where Saul was the king and David was going to be the king one day and, and, and Saul was not God's guy. He was the people's guy. And he struggled with some kind of psychiatric problem where he, he struggled all the time. And, 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 and what David would do was the future king would come in and he would play worship for Saul. And it would be the only thing that would calm him down. It would be the only thing that would get him up off the walls and, and get to the point where he could, he could worship God and do the things that he was supposed to do. There's just, there's just, there's, there's so many reasons to be at church that are life-changing things. And, and, and we live in a culture nowadays where people didn't grow up, most of you didn't grow up going to church all the time, so that's not a part. But if, but if you'll make being part of the worship family a part of what you do all the time, and a commitment that you make, that... That, that this this time slot, this is my time slot for God. And, and I'll just tell you, be honest, be honest. If you miss Sunday morning and Sunday morning worship and the Sunday morning teaching and stuff like that, there's probably not a really good opportunity for you to do that for the rest of the week. You maybe could go to a Wednesday night service somewhere or something like that, but, but you're probably not. So what happens is, is when you miss this opportunity, you, you miss out on a lot of opportunities. And, and this opportunity, I always call our pep rally. It's the thing that gets us, it, it's the thing that gets us reconnected with God and, and, and stop thinking about the stuff that's going on out there. But number seven is we get great joy in our relationship with God for now and for eternity. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us what? Friends of God. How cool is that? And, and the way that it happened was Jesus made a sacrifice, but God made a sacrifice for us. While we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. And